Welcome back to The Basement. I'm Steve Lewis. We're now up to the months of October, November, December 1964. It's been an eventful year so far, and it's not going to let up anytime soon. This time, I hope to get through music early in the quarter, plus movies, news, and television, so that we can devote most of next week to talking about the Beach Boys. Starting with music, top albums as the quarter began on October 3rd at the top of the chart was the Beatles soundtrack, A Hard Day's Night. This had gone to number one on July 25th and had been there for 11 weeks. It'll remain at number one until October 31st, giving it a total of 14 weeks at number one. At number two was the Beatles' Something New. It had been number two since August 22nd. It'll remain there for two more weeks, giving it a total of nine weeks at number two, always behind the other Beatles album, A Hard Day's Night. At number three was Everybody Loves Somebody by Dean Martin. Dean Martin's album had been in third place, stuck behind the two Beatles albums, since September 5th. It will eventually hit number two on October 31st, once the Beatles albums have completed their runs at the top of the chart. Peter, Paul, and Mary in Concert was in the second of three weeks at its number four peak. The Beach Boys' All Summer Long album was at number five. As discussed, it had spent five weeks at number four beginning August 22nd. At number six was How Glad I Am by Nancy Wilson. It'll reach number four on November 14th and stay there for two weeks. It was her third top ten album of 1964. The Gates Gilberto album was at number seven. It's one of three albums still in the top ten from the beginning of the third quarter. The album had been released back in March and had started to climb the charts once The Girl from Ipanema had become a hit single in the summer. As discussed earlier, it had been number two for two weeks beginning August 8th. At number eight was the Funny Girl Cast album featuring Barbara Streisand, another album that had been in the top ten at the beginning of the prior quarter. As discussed, it had spent the first three weeks of June at number three. At number nine was the original cast album of Hello, Dolly, the third of the three albums still in the top ten from the beginning of the third quarter. This one had even been in the top ten at the beginning of the second quarter. As discussed, it had been number one on June 6th. And at number 10, Keep On Pushing by The Impressions. It'll peak at number 8 next week, October 10th. And in top singles as the quarter began, at number 1, Oh Pretty Woman by Roy Orbison. Roy Orbison was one of the relatively few pre-Beatles rock acts to continue having major hits after the British invasion, including this, his biggest single of all, and his only number one apart from 1961's Running Scared. Oh Pretty Woman was in the second of three weeks at number one. At number two was yet another rock and roll hit from England, Do I Diddy Diddy? by Manfred Mann. It'll replace Oh Pretty Woman at number one for two weeks beginning October 17th. Bread and Butter by The New Beats was at number three. It had been number two for the prior two weeks. Dancing in the Street by Martha and the Vandellas was at number four. It'll go to number two for two weeks beginning October 17th. Remember, Walking in the Sand by The Shangri-Las was in the second of three weeks at its number five peak. GTO by Ronnie and the Daytonas was at number six. It was one of the last of the hit car songs, a genre that was red hot a year earlier. It had been number four a week earlier on September 26th. It hurts to be in love by Gene Pitney was in the first of two weeks at its number seven peak. The Animal's House of the Rising Sun was at number eight. As discussed earlier, it had been number one for the first three weeks of September. We'll sing in the sunshine by Gail Garnett was at number nine. It'll spend three weeks at number four beginning October 17th. And Save It For Me by The Four Seasons was in the last of two weeks at its number 10 peak. Top 10 singles that will come and go in the fourth quarter included The Beach Boys, When I Grow Up To Be A Man. As discussed, this will peak at number nine for two weeks beginning October 17th. There was also a summer song by Chad Stewart and Jeremy Clyde, England's Chad and Jeremy, will go to number seven for two weeks beginning October 24th. Baby Love will be another big chart topper for the Supremes. It'll be number one for four weeks beginning October 31st. Little Honda by the Hondells, another hit penned by and featuring a vocal from Brian Wilson, will go to number nine on October 31st as discussed earlier. Frank J. Wilson and the Cavaliers' Last Kiss will go to number two on November 7th. Let It Be Me by Betty Everett and Jerry Butler will go to number five on November 7th. 
Another country novelty hit from Roger Miller, Chugalug, following up on his hit Dang Me from earlier in the year, will go to number 9 on November 7th. Have I the right? By the Honeycombs will go to number 5 on November 14th. The door is still open to my heart. Another big hit for Dean Martin will go to number 6 on November 14th. Come a Little Bit Closer by Jay and the Americans will be number 3 for two weeks beginning November 21st. Leader of the Pack by the Shangri-Las was a quick follow-up to their hit Remember, Walking in the Sand. This one will do even better, going all the way to number 1 on November 28th. Another English rock band having its first U.S. hit, The Kinks, You Really Got Me, will go to number 7 for three weeks beginning November 28th. There was Mountain of Love by Johnny Rivers. The song's writer, Harold Dorman, had taken it to number 21 in June of 1960. Johnny Rivers' version will go to number 9 on December 5th. It's a song that will, of course, be covered by the Beach Boys on the Party album about a year from now. I'm Gonna Be Strong by Gene Pitney will spend two weeks at number 9 beginning December 12th. In notable new album releases, on October 3rd we got Dean Martin's The Door Is Still Open To My Heart album. On October 17th came the Rolling Stones 12 by 5. On October 19th, we got the Beach Boys concert album. Much more about this later, of course. The album for Elvis Presley's new movie Roustabout was released on October 20th. Also released in October was Joan Baez 5, which will reach number 12 early in the new year. The soundtrack to the season's big new film release, the musical My Fair Lady and great songs from My Fair Lady and other Broadway hits by Andy Williams. It was yet another big hit album for Andy Williams, continuing his very successful formula of quickly releasing his own versions of songs from current films and Broadway shows. This one will hit number 5 for two weeks beginning December 12th. Released on November 9th, The Beach Boys Christmas Album. We talked about this way back in episode 44. I'm sure we'll discuss it again in a future episode. And on November 23rd came the release of The Beatles Story. With no new Beatles album ready for the important holiday sales season, Capitol released this double album documentary recording. It was about the Beatles rather than by the Beatles. It did feature some brief snippets from their records and 48 seconds of Twist and Shout recorded live that summer at the Hollywood Bowl, which was otherwise unreleased. The album was produced by Brian Wilson's frequent collaborators Gary Usher and Roger Christian, with portions of the documentary written and narrated by Christian. I imagine this was under a lot of Christmas trees in 1964, and for U.S. fans it probably represented the beginning of a long association between the Beatles and Christmas, which for some of us continues to this day. Also released in November was the original cast album for Fiddler on the Roof, It'll reach number 7 for two weeks beginning January 30th, 1965. And on December 15th came Beatles 65. With the release of the I Feel Fine single and Beatles for sale in the UK in early December, Capitol finally had enough tracks to assemble a new Beatles album for the US market. They took both sides of the single, eight tracks from the Beatles for sale, plus I'll Be Back, still unreleased in America from A Hard Day's Night, and put together Beatles 65. Beginning with the Beatles' second album, Capitol had apparently decided that 11, instead of the customary 12 tracks, was enough for a Beatles album. There weren't enough shopping days left before Christmas for Capitol to really take advantage of the album for the holidays, especially when you remember that most retail stores were still closed on Sundays in 1964. Like the Beatles albums that came before it, it'll shoot to number one, but not until the second week of January. This left Capitol with six unreleased Beatles for sale tracks, enough for one side of yet another U.S. album to come. We'll talk more about that when we get to 1965. Also released in December was My Love Forgive Me by Robert Goulet. It'll hit number five the last week of February 1965 and Coast to Coast by the Dave Clark Five. Their last studio album had been called American Tour. Coast to Coast featured the group in front of a map of the continental U.S. It, too, was a studio album. It'll also be another big U.S. hit, reaching number six in the last week of February 1965. And also released around this time was the soundtrack to the new James Bond film, Goldfinger. It'll go to number one on March 20th, 1965. And that presents us with an excellent segue into films. 
Notable movie releases in the fourth quarter of 1964 included Sidney Lumet's Failsafe, released on October 7th, about a U.S. nuclear attack accidentally launched on the Soviet Union. It was kind of Dr. Strangelove without the black comedy and played as a thriller, starring Henry Fonda, Walter Matthau, and Larry Hagman. On October 21st came one of the season's big movie releases, the big screen musical My Fair Lady, starring Audrey Hepburn as Eliza Doolittle and Rex Harrison as Professor Henry Higgins. It'll be number one at the box office on November 4th and for another six weeks until December 30th. Again for another seven weeks in February and March of 65 and once more for the week of April 21st, 1965. At the Academy Awards ceremony on April 5th, 1965, it'll win Best Director for George Cukor, Best Actor for Rex Harrison, and Best Picture of 1964. Released on October 27th was the romantic comedy The Americanization of Emily with James Garner and Julie Andrews. On November 4th, George Hamilton, of all people, is Hank Williams in the fictionalized film biography Your Cheatin' Heart. On November 11th came Roustabout, the third and final Elvis movie of the year. Also on November 11th, Annette Funicello and Tommy Kirk, the stars of Disney's The Misadventures of Merlin Jones from earlier in the year, were back together in AIP's newest beach party type movie, Pajama Party. The rest of the beach gang was there too, even Frankie Avalon in a sneaky cameo role. Released on December 16th was another Jerry Lewis comedy, The Disorderly Orderly. One day later on December 17th came Anthony Quinn in Zorba the Greek. And on December 20th, we got Cary Grant and Leslie Caron in the comedy Father Goose. On December 22nd, Bond was back in his third feature, Goldfinger. The first two films had been popular. This one will become a runaway hit with memorable gadgets like the customized Aston Martin, memorable characters like the hat-throwing assassin Oddjob, fantastic settings, and wild action. With Goldfinger, James Bond and the secret agent craze in movies and TV really takes off. It'll be number one at year end and for the first six weeks of 1965. More about this when we get to that year. Released on December 25th was Sex and the Single Girl, starring Tony Curtis as fictional magazine publisher Bob Weston and Natalie Wood as a fictionalized version of the author of the book of the same name, Helen Gurley Brown. For 1964, this was about as sophisticated and racy as a movie could get which is to say, pretty tame. And released on December 29th was The Tammy Show, featuring performances by, among others, Jan and Dean, Chuck Berry, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Marvin Gaye, Leslie Gore, The Supremes, James Brown, The Rolling Stones, and of course, our old friends, The Beach Boys. We talked about this extensively way back in episodes 64 and 65, and we'll talk about it some more next time. Some notable news stories from the fourth quarter of 1964. On October 14th, American civil rights activist Martin Luther King Jr. receives the Nobel Peace Prize. On October 15th, composer and lyricist Cole Porter passes away at the age of 73. And on October 20th, former U.S. President Herbert Hoover dies at the age of 90. From October 6th through November 7th, the American Supermarket Exhibition takes place at the Bianchini Gallery in New York. The event displays work by the new wave of pop artists including Andy Warhol, Jasper Johns, Roy Lichtenstein, Kales Oldenburg, Richard Artschweger, and Robert Watts in a setting that was made to look like a real supermarket. Like a real supermarket, everything was for sale. Like an art gallery, the prices had no relation to the actual cost of the goods. Roy Lichtenstein's turkey bags went for $12. Robert Watts' chrome wax eggs went for $24 a dozen. Andy Warhol offered normal cans of Campbell's soup, which he had signed for $18. Of course, it was all a wry comment on our consumerist society and was applauded by some and derided by others. On November 3rd, President Lyndon Johnson, who had assumed office on the death of President Kennedy less than a year earlier, was elected to a term of his own in a landslide victory against Republican challenger Barry Goldwater. Johnson won 61% of the popular vote, the largest margin since the relatively uncontested presidential race of 1820, and carried every state except Goldwater's home state of Arizona and five states in the Deep South. 
On December 11th, entertainer Sam Cooke is tragically shot and killed in a never adequately explained incident by the manager of a motel he had checked into. And on television in the fourth quarter, on October 5th, a slight latecomer to the fall TV season was NBC's 90 Bristol Court. Three sitcoms which aired back-to-back -back on Monday nights linked only by the fact they were all set in the same Southern California apartment complex. There was Tom, Dick, and Mary about a married couple sharing an apartment with a swinging bachelor. Harris Against the World starring Jack Klugman as a businessman, husband, and father facing everyday frustrations. And Karen, a family sitcom about a kooky, energetic, modern teenage girl played by Debbie Watson. In January, the 90 Bristol Court concept will be scrapped and two of the three series canceled. Karen will carry on for the remainder of the television season. We discussed Karen pretty extensively way back in episode 13. All three series were quickly forgotten and are only being mentioned here because Karen's theme song was sung by our old friends the Beach Boys. The song was written by the show's music director Jack Marshall and producer Bob Mosier of the production team of Connolly and Mosier who, in addition to Karen, had produced the long-running Leave it to Beaver series and another new series this season, The Monsters. On Sunday, November 15th, ABC airs Around the Beatles, a musical variety special starring the Beatles, which had been taped in London in April. Guests included Cilla Black, PJ Proby, Millie Small, and Murray the K. The Beatles kicked off the show with a comic performance from A Midsummer Night's Dream and closed it with a performance of some cover songs and their hits, at least those songs that had been hits in the spring. As the show made plain, they had already come a long way since then. On Sunday, December 6th, we got the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer animated special from Rankin Bass. Rudolph first appeared in a 1939 booklet written by Robert L. May and published by Montgomery Ward Department Stores. May's brother, Johnny Marks, adapted the story to a song in 1949, which became a number one hit for Gene Autry at Christmas 1949 and until the 80s, the biggest selling record of all time. The story was well-known and well-loved by the time of the Rankin-Bass special in 1964. It featured songs written by Johnny Marks, who had written the original Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer song. A couple of those songs, Holly Jolly Christmas and Silver and Gold, were sung by Burl Ives, who voiced the narrator Sam the Snowman. In addition to Sam, the show introduced characters like Hermie the Elf, Yukon Cornelius, Claire Reese, and the abominable Snowman. I loved it as a kid, and I still do, though as I've gotten older, I thought that if they had known it was going to become a beloved holiday classic, they might have spent more than 20 minutes putting it together. And if you were a kid watching Rudolph that night, you might have been hoping to get some of the hot new toy releases of the year. There were Rock'em Sock'em Robots, in which kids controlled one of two boxing robots, the Red Rocker or the Blue Bomber, and attempted to knock the other's block off. By Marx. From Mattel, there were creepy crawlers, allowing kids to make their own soft plastic bugs and lizards. All you had to do was fill a metal mold with plastic goop, plug in the Thing Maker, which was basically a small hot plate that heated up to about 10,000 degrees, use a small wire hook to put the mold into the Thing Maker, and heat it until it solidified. Using a large pin, you'd pry it out of the mold and have a creepy crawler to scare and amuse your friends. Looking back, it was all ridiculously dangerous for a bunch of kids, and I personally had burns on my fingers from using it. Nevertheless, creepy crawlers will be extremely successful in the 1960s. It'll be followed by other thing maker sets like Creeple People in 1965, Fright Factory in 1966, and Mini Dragons in 1967. The biggest and most influential new toy of 1964 was undoubtedly G.I. Joe from Hasbro. Older boys sneered at it as a doll. Younger kids thought it was the coolest toy around. In a lot of ways, Joe was just a scaled-up, articulated, and detailed version of the Little Green Army men that kids had been playing with for years. With his accessories and wardrobe changes, though, some kids thought he looked like a very uncool Barbie for boys. Either way, G.I. Joe will be a huge hit this holiday season and fundamentally change the toy business, ultimately, years later, leading to someone coining the term action figure. And that'll bring us to the end of this episode. Please join us next week when we wrap up 1964, including an in-depth look at what the Beach Boys were up to in the fourth quarter of the year. 
Hope you enjoyed this. As always, I look forward to your comments and feedback. Please hit like if you don't mind and subscribe if you haven't. I always appreciate that. Have a great week. Thanks for watching. Bye.